morning, everyone. Um, so thank you very much for joining. Um, this is um, a, a really key event in our calendar. Andrew's been given this, um, uh, I think it's not too grand to say, State of the Nation uh, since he became Chief Exec of uh, the City of Edinburgh Council back in 2015. Uh, so really uh, welcome, Andrew, to, uh, to the session today. I'm sure it will be a stimulating um, session. He always gives us a very honest and transparent update of, of the challenges and the achievements at City of Edinburgh. Um, and having balanced your budget last year, uh, finding um, significant cost savings over a three year period, um, the pandemic struck us and, and in particular the City Council a really cruel blow. Um, so I think we all probably at that point had to go back to the drawing board. Um, but it's a really critical job that Andrew does and his team does at the, the Council ensuring that we keep uh, delivering key services and really keeping the city going. So I'm just gonna uh, give us that review of, of that particularly difficult year last year, but also the plans as we move forward into hopefully a better year, um, what the plans are for recovery and continued prosperity across the city. So uh, delighted Andrew is joining us and over to you, Andrew. I think uh, Jane, uh, you're quite right to um, say that what I was going to do is reflect a bit on, on last year and try at the end to reflect more on the future about what this looks like for the city. And I'm trying to give it, I will try and give it a bit of a business um, feel to it because uh, much of what we do with businesses is very much behind the scenes. And I, I think it's worthwhile just outlining some of that um, stuff that we do um, as part and parcel of this. So at least um, uh, hopefully the audience goes away um, as well informed as they need to be, as well as um, uh, having to listen to me uh, moaning about the situation I ended up in. Um, I, I, when I did this um, speech last year, uh, Jane's right to say that I outlined, um, I, I was almost smug to myself in saying that we now had a three year balanced budget, the council was in good financial position, acts of the city was thriving, we had a, the economic was going, uh, economy was growing great guns, Actually, the biggest thing we had to think about was, um, uh, did we have too much tourism? Did we have too many visitors? Did we, how was the city going to cope in terms of infrastructure, et cetera? And that was the big debate at the time. And certainly running into last Christmas, that's exactly what it was. And then of course, somebody threw um, a, a great big COVID bomb right in the middle of that. Um, sometime towards the end of January probably was the first conversation I logged that I had about it, which was somebody saying there's a virus in China going around um, that um, uh, there is a rumour that some of it's landed in Britain. Um, uh, and that was that, that was coming towards the end of January. We had that discussion. Uh, and uh, of course, in retrospect, we then knew that it already landed. I think that uh, we just weren't well, well enough aware of it. Uh, and although Scottish Government and our NHS colleagues were um, starting to deal with um, small outbreaks, um, it only really became public towards the beginning of February. So on February 28th, I, I sat down with my team and we set up a daily management team and we're still meeting. Corporate Incident Management Team will meet today at lunchtime, where we meet daily to discuss what we're doing operationally in the city to cope with the COVID vaccine. Never mind. Uh, anything else that, that, that goes about for running the city. But um, in March, what we did in effect was close down everything. We closed down schools, we closed down leisure centres, we closed down community centres, we closed down our waste management operation, our recycling. Uh, we, uh, we set out right at the beginning to make sure that whatever we did as a result of this pandemic was we looked after the three principles we set out, which still hold well with us, I think, was that we looked after the welfare of our colleagues, looked after the welfare of our citizens, and uh, made sure we continued to deliver the services that were needed and as far as we could do in the circumstances. And we've tried to stick with those principles. So our public health agenda, as much as anything else, because we are having to follow the government agenda. Um, I, um, and of course, although the government latterly and ourselves of, of um, thought more and more about what they call the four harms. In other words, uh, you know, it's not just a public health pandemic, this is an economic pandemic, this is a, um, a mental health pandemic, et cetera, et cetera, that we have to think about everybody's well-being in the truest sense of the word. 
Um, at the beginning of this year, that was not really the case. It was closed down everything so we could have a lockdown to stop this thing spreading. And one of my reflections would be right now is part of the difficulty we're having right now, much more difficult now, right now, because actually we didn't do that. It's quite an easy thing to shut everything down. I said that, it wasn't easy at the time, of course, but I say that in retrospect. It is relatively easy if you're shutting everything down. You just say, right, everything stops, we don't do anything else. And for a little while, that'll be okay, won't it? Because it'll only be a week or so and we'll be back uh, normal. But of course, it's now lasted uh, much longer than that. Um, and we started, I think, with, uh, and I see Alice on the, on the call, but we started working almost immediately with our third sector partners and talking about make, looking after the most vulnerable. So looking at things like food distribution, looking at our homeless population. So as some of you will be aware, we put most of our homeless population into two hotels. Um, and, um, and that happened very early on in the, in the pandemic. So we literally took over two hotels, um, the Waverley and another one, um, and enabled, to, to, uh, enabled us to take most of our homeless population off the street. Um, which meant that we were able to give them services much more easily in a, in a much more, uh, a relatively safe environment. Um, and we started spending money. Uh, and I think we started spending money without an idea how we were going to do that at the end. Um, I, and then started, of course, immediately as a business losing income. So as you can imagine, in a city, we uh, take quite a lot of our income from tram and from, uh, from our buses. And they started operating, of course, at 5% and 10% of their normal uh, route, running a very minimal service in the beginning. And, and in fact, to some extent, still continue to do so, although the service is still fully up and running. We're still only got, um, I think, 40% on our buses and something like 10 or 15% on our tram. Um, so we're still um, losing income and although government are giving us some help now in that area, um, that was probably the biggest effect in our organization as we, as we went through the first few months. Um, and of course, the other thing is like everyone else, the whole council started working from home. So everything from our contact center to our uh, management to everything with the big exception of face-to-face -face and one-to-one -one social care, was um, was we we halted, and everybody started working from home. And the thing that staggered me, if I was to reflect, is that um, we've managed to do that, continue to do that, in the vast majority of our work um, for the whole year, without too many glitches. And although we have some problems working out whether it should be a Zoom meeting, a Teams meeting, a Skype meeting, or and anything else, like everyone else does. Um, we, um, we've we managed uh, amazingly well. And in fact, at one time, my whole contact center was working from home. Some of them have come back in in the last six months. And actually, two weeks ago, they all went back out again and they're now all working from home completely. And actually, I haven't seen, although you may tell me differently, I haven't seen that there's been any difference in terms of the ability to contact them and them. So they've been uh, done a fantastic job actually of managing to maintain those services as they go. We also set up um, what I would call emergency governance. So um, as a chief executive authority, I have the legal power to deal with emergency measures in terms of resilience. So if we had a terrorist attack, I would have the same powers. And those emergency powers were invoked both by government and by the council. So we stopped having formal committee meetings. We made the vast majority of those decisions through me um, in conjunction with my leader and deputy leader, it, where it was politically controversial. Um, and I think to date, um, to date in this year, I've made something like 1,673 formal decisions under these emergency powers. So, you know, benign dictatorship as, as, as without in the council um, uh, for quite considerable time. We're now back, of course, meeting in committees again, because we managed to get back to working at how we did that um, remotely. Uh, and our politicians are starting to make decisions. Are starting to make decisions now, but for quite a considerable time, particularly for six months, it was me and a couple of others, and and um, that allowed us to move swiftly enough, um, if um, uh, to deal with the pandemic. So it was then uh, after that all happened. It was a case of then what happens. Well, what does the city need as it continues and. 
we started to open up schools for key workers and set up hubs for the schools. Um, we uh, got our bin collections up and running full belt and that's happened all the way through, despite the fact you can only have two people in a cab as opposed to three people in a cab and we've had to have cars following lorries and all the logistics that come from uh, uh, doing that. Um, and uh, our recycling centres open to allow people to recycle the goods given that they're mostly at home. There's a lot of demand for recycling going on. Um, and we did that a little bit better than the rest of the country because everybody else had seemed to have seven mile car queues um, outside the recycling centres, but we had a good appointment system that worked, which is um, as much by good luck as by good judgment, I think sometimes, but we, we, we managed to do that and put that in place. We worked um, with um, EVOC, et cetera, on um, starting to filter money through the volunteers network and starting to get volunteers to do the things in the communities that perhaps the local authority couldn't deliver and um, embedded the work on our homelessness in these two, two hotels. So got our social care, police, et cetera, working together in those. Um, as for business, and we, I think we realised quite early on, of course, that um, particularly for a city, shutting down business is not exactly either good for the economy or good for anyone, and particularly not good for business. So we, of course, our team that's been fully working all the way through has been an environmental health team, giving advice to businesses for the number of changing rest restrictions. I can't overemphasise how many times the guidance has changed from Scottish Government. At one point, um, I think in one week, we had something like nine changes of guidance just on how we run businesses. Um, uh, and it's changed almost daily at some point right at the beginning and continues to change as we go. Um, I, I was just having a discussion with my corporate management team this morning about um, uh, why certain businesses are able to open when it feels uncomfortable that they are, because they're not really um, uh, going with the uh, guidance, but there's an interpretation of guidance going on, which you can understand, of course, people wanting keen to be still open as they go. But if you're, um, for instance, a cycle shop who uh, or you sell cycles, that means you can open for most of the things. Garden centres open because they're, they're giving out food. All of those things that people are starting to um, interpret, which wasn't happening in the beginning, but is now happening more. So guidance has been um, really important. We started with, uh, you know, once we got more guidance on where in restaurants could open, you know, open widening pavements. And uh, we gave some financial support to the festivals and to um, to the fringe to allow it to not to fall over. And this year, with the hope that this year, when we come back, there will be some version of that very big attraction for Edinburgh businesses into the city. Um, and we, we ran into this year um, thinking that we, our biggest problem was over tourism. And therefore, we're we're shutting down. Um, we're, we're shutting down, and made the decision to shut down our operations around marketing in Edinburgh, etc. And of course, that's um, proven to be not ever the best decision in the in the current circumstances you could ever have made. And we're and we're spending quite a lot of time this year trying to work out with the tourism and hospitality industry what we do as an alternative, um, because we need to think that through. And then uh, things like temporary suspension of parking to encourage people to continue to use the shops they could use um, happened. We then, of course, had to think about business survival. And we set up a, a full-time, 100 people, full-time uh, team uh, right across the council to distribute uh, business, you know, business survival grants that were coming from government. It continues to be a very, very complex issue. There's so many grants now that I don't think I could tell you off the top of my head that all of them. But if I give you some examples, we distributed 118 million pounds to Edinburgh businesses or in terms of uh, business grants to 9,600 business, a coronavirus support business grant of 3.2 million to 1,300 businesses. New self-employed and B&B hardship grant of 1.1 million to different businesses. Contingency, um, uh, uh, COVID-19 contingency to nightclubs and things like that uh, of 0 0.6 million to 17 businesses in the city. Um, uh, furlough support of 700,000 to 410 businesses and strategic framework support, which we're still working on with the government about how we deliver um, that, because it's a relatively large sum of money, continues to come out. But in total, that meant we had to find a way of distributing quickly 
123 million pounds worth of grant aid to 11 and a half thousand businesses so um uh, quite a large task and my you know i'm actually very proud of my team that they managed to do so 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 quickly and and with relative little controversy um because as you can imagine everybody does think that they are the priority for grants such as that and we had to go with a whole bunch of changing regulations and rules from government as we went i mean what's coming up next of course is we're still looking at how we distribute the 30 million pound discretionary grant 15 million pound to new self-employed grant and another 150 85 thousand that will go to hospitality businesses etc and um government still to give us the rules and regulations for that but watch out for that sometime soon and, and of course, our business, business as usual continued. So we continued giving out benefits, continued giving out welfare, dealing with council tax. We gave relief to business rates for most of the businesses that occupied our premises. So um, we normally in a year um, take in 14 million pounds worth of, of um, um, rent from businesses that use warehouse, et cetera. We lost 9 million pounds of that um, income because we gave those businesses that were COVID affected, and that was the uh, the, the rule that we set, um, relief on their rent for those premises, etc. Temporary relief on, those, on, um, on those rents. We deferred license costs to taxi owners. We gave rent relief to uh, a number of businesses and made sure there was one place for businesses on our web. So we had to, we gave some considerable thought about what our business as usual looked like whilst we were in this middle of the pandemic. And then as well as all that, we had to deal with the rest. So our return to schools and digital learning, which went famously well yesterday when teams went down, um, teams went down nationally, um, <laughs> not our fault, but never mind. Um, uh, we still got all the screaming. Um, uh, you know, open up leisure where possible and then shutting it back down. Uh, making sure we maintain parks and green spaces and the ability of people to access outdoor spaces to, to deal with their own mental health and their exercise, etc. Uh, famously, battle on toilets and whether we should open public toilets for people to get drunk in the meadows for, um, um, which um, as a chief executive, I wasn't very happy about, but never mind, that's the, the decision we made. Um, what were the universities and their plans? Because obviously students coming in and out of the city is a very big thing. 84,000 students land in the city. And of course, um, we had to think about what the effect they had on the pandemic and the spread of the, uh, of the, the vaccine, et cetera. Um, uh, equally controversially, spaces for people. So giving people places um, so they could walk and cycle more easily and not use their cars, et cetera. And in some places that's worked really well, some places I think self-evidently not quite so well. And one of the big issues we'll have to think about going forward is what, how many of those become permanent uh, uh, to allow the city to uh, start to achieve its net zero carbon uh, uh, wishes. And some of that was funded by government. Um, we continued because construction was allowed to continue with the tram extension, which is something we did set out to do this year and we've managed to continue to do so. And in fact, probably been able to accelerate uh, how quickly it's gone uh, just because the streets are less busy, less traffic, et cetera, et cetera. We have to think about libraries opening and then um, even right up to date, um, how do we deliver gritting <coughs> when I've got uh, 350 of our uh, normal frontline workers off shielding, we've got another 200 off ill with COVID and the capacity issues that cause us in trying to, to continue with business as usual. So for our business, that meant that we spent 90 million pounds last year, there or thereabouts. Um, I think it was 88.7 something factually. Uh, and we got about 40 million pounds worth of that back from government. So it left quite a big gaping hole in our, uh, in our current uh, finances. Uh, we've had to adjust to a full way of new remote working. Um, we have to make sure that we're dealing with those larger amounts of absences than we would normally have had uh, and still maintain services, which has been our biggest issue. And given that we are 18,000 staff, that's usually quite large numbers in terms of staff. And uh, it's not so surprising that um, we're trying to provide FM to everywhere, schools everywhere to keep them clean. 
and deal with COVID, but actually one of the biggest absences we've got is our cleaners who are all of a certain age and uh, usually part-time female workers who are under look, either look after children are ill or are, or are shielding because of their age and that's the type of thing. And, you know, lollipop people, people who are uh, looking after our schools um, are, are all of a certain age, aren't they? So that's everything, not everything we had to do, but uh, is a kind of quick potted history of, of the last year. We're now looking a little bit more to what happens when we come out of COVID now, and we're just about to set uh, a new business plan and a new budget. And in fact, that will come to council on February the 18th. And um, it's a tough time to do a new business plan, I think, for all of you, because the uncertainty for you as businesses and for us as a local authority remain the same. Um, but we are uh, determined that what we are going to try and do is renew our business better um, when, as we come out of this than we are when we're right in the middle of it. And we've learned lots of lessons, um, a really clear lesson, for instance, about we set up resilience centres across the city at local level that are working very, very well. We think we're now going to extend that network of resilience centres just permanently because that seems to be something the public likes, something uh, we are managing to operate, and, uh, and that helps us get through uh, the business. We're going to set. We're going to use the city vision priorities as the as the guiding light for everything we do, and um, we're going to set three priorities for the next um, three or four years: one to reduce poverty, second to uh, deal with a climate emergency and set and try and achieve our net zero 2030 plan. Another one is looking after the well-being in all its senses: that's economic well-being, health, and well-being of individuals. Uh, as we go forward. And to do that, I think we're, we're, we're intending to deliver that through six themes, one around prevention, more family intervention, another thing we've learned from COVID, looking at poverty and allowing people to access that which they are already entitled to. As uh, Ella will know, of course, we've got £84 million in the city, supposedly comes in from the UK government in terms of welfare, our citizens only access something like 40, 40 million pounds of it. So we are going to put a lot of effort into giving people advice about how to access that which they are already entitled to. And given that we're likely to have more people unemployed and more people uh, needing welfare, we feel that's maybe the quickest and best way we can do, uh, do to enable the economy to start to um, recover at that level. We're hoping that we're going to continue to allow people to thrive. So adult protection is something that's been raised through the um, through the pandemic, more domestic abuse, et cetera, and making sure we're leaning into that type of issue. We're going to expand our early years provision to, to nearer the 1140 hours we've got. And of course, setting up digital learning. We just distributed 700 iPads out to our schools. Actually, yesterday, we've ordered another 1,700 um, and that's to deal with the pandemic, but we think has a permanent effect on particularly where we've got um, a difference between those um, young people who are able to access learning facilities in their own home and those that are not. So a big digital divide appearing in the city that wasn't perhaps there before. Um, we're going to invest in our localities. Um, we're going to work on uh, the whole theory of 20 minute neighbourhoods and how we develop local shops, local uh, medical facilities, local facilities in the truest sense of the word, making sure we've got the right facilities in the right place so that people can walk easily to facilities going on, as well as looking after as one of those localities, the city centre, which is of course very important to the economy of Edinburgh. Um, and in that case, the other thing we've learned is the quite a big demand for community asset transfer. So we will transfer some of our assets over to the community to run because that's what they want to do. Um, and particularly our community centre network um, has um, opened up to the communities very well this year, mostly through the third sector and, and uh, voluntary committees. We're going to find a way of letting them run our community centres, which is because it is maybe it's the best way to deliver wealth doing it within money. And then uh, as far as um, the economy is concerned, uh, we'll be renewing our economic strategy because we, we, we understand it needs to change. I think some of the things that have happened are, are more pointy than others. 
Um, uh, but of course, we thought we had a very successful thriving economy going into this, which we did. Um, it will be slightly less thriving and le uh, less well um, coming out of it. So we're going to have to help um, that doing so. We're expanding the Edinburgh Guarantee Scheme, for instance. I am chairing that meeting this afternoon alongside um, key businesses in this city. Um, we're looking with the industry at the recovery of the tourism and hospitality, hospitality industry as we go. And we're going to set up a smart cities ops centre for the city so that the city is operated better in terms of traffic and, and those type of issues that we go forward. And of course, we're working with um, um, partners on ensuring that the fibre rollout so that there's digital connection right throughout the city is accelerated as much as it can be. Um, right throughout, and um, we, we we benefit, of course, from um, good competition between um, BT Openreach and and City Fibre. So that's good. Both both those companies are working with us to try and make sure we deliver. Um, to deal with a climate emergency, we are going to um, set out a heat and energy master plan, and we're working with businesses already about what that means for um, some of the big businesses. Some of the best examples in the city already about leaning into um, leaning into the climate emergency I've been our businesses uh, you know everything from the brewery and in, in down in the Gorgie giving money to uh, to uh, the school and to Hearts football club uh, and, um, and and sharing that heat and energy that they generate through that process etc to um, to our housing colleagues who are uh, helping us think about the standard of which we start to rebuild those houses. And making sure that we um, we've got a reduction in emissions. Of course, we're looking at a reduction of our own emissions and retrofitting all council houses as we go, and that will be part and parcel of that. And last thing, uh, really, in terms of that plan, is thinking about how do we create a sustainable city, a better city coming out of um, COVID. City plan for 2030 will hit everyone soon, and that's going to be a major decision between. How much of the green belt do we use and how much do we retrofit brownfield sites to allow housing, to allow businesses to uh, grow in the city, build 20,000 new homes, which is still our target, um, and accelerate the city centre transformation plan and the mobility plan, the city mobility plan, to make sure that we've got flow in and out the city and that the city centre um, thrives. Helped, of course, by the fact in some way that uh, St James's is about to uh, uh, open in April, uh, uh, which of course was partly a council initiative, and and we are um, of course um, paying for all the public realm uh, around the St James's um, Centre, etc., and helping that business get up and running, um, and of course dealing with Brexit, um, whatever dealing with Brexit actually means. And if you're as confused about it, I think so are we. Um, uh, but I understand I'm waiting with um, bated breath about a government plan, a year's plan for Brexit, which is about to come out this week, uh, which is telling us where the key legislative bits of Brexit are going to hit us. And we will have a plan and hopefully share with you immediately. We get that um, once we know when that comes out of that. Um, for us, it is about making sure that we are delivering some of the big infrastructure stuff. So. Tram, Granton, Fountain Bridge, uh, West Edinburgh, and making sure those continue uh, du during this um, uh, during this pandemic, but as we come out of it. For us, that means more clever use of our finances. We are uh, look, we've asked government for lots of freedoms around whether we can. Um, my my accountant would call it kicking the can down the road in terms of our debt. Um, but um, means we can use, find a way of uh, getting to balance and help um, coming out of the pandemic. More partnership work, particularly with our third sector colleagues. Um, we need to reshape the council to deliver what I've just described to you there. Um, 20 minute neighbourhoods will mean more localities, more multidisciplinary staffing. Uh, uh, and then trying to embed, to be fair to everyone, our part of the economy is to embed the living wage in what we do. And that will include um, our work in procurement, but actually even for our own staff, that has a 25 million pound tag um, uh, extra on making sure that the living wage is embedded for every single one of our employees. 
uh, and we have to restructure our whole wage structure to make to cope with that. So that's going to be an interesting part. And then the last thing to say is we're all running towards elections. So um, uh, in uh, general election in May um, will be uh, uh, an interesting result. Uh, in uh, Edinburgh, that's 99% likely to be held at Highland Show. For the count, we are looking at extra uh, places to go and vote because we have to, so you can be socially distanced while you're doing so. Um, and, um, and then, of course, 12 months later, a uh, local election where our council, all our council will be up for election. So interesting political times. Um, whether, uh, and my last um, thought maybe is that uh, particularly if um, uh, uh, SNP have a large victory in the general election, whether there's some consideration of an independence uh, referendum coming to um, a cinema somewhere near us soon. Uh, okay, I, I'm going to leave it at that because it was a kind of very big run through of, of everything we are uh, thinking about. Um, I'm really positive about the future. Uh, I think we've got a good chance to renew coming out of this. The vaccine, uh, and, and I didn't mention how much we we're working on just delivering the vaccine run out uh, and community testing, which is the thing I'm going to on a meeting today at lunchtime. Uh, so more and more te mass testing in the population, mass, mass vaccinations give us a chance to think about that at least towards the end of the year that we've started to return more to whatever normal looks like. What I hope in the council is that normal is better than it was going into this. And that's what we're planning to do. And I think that's um, that agenda I just um, outlined to you is how we hope to do so. Very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um... I'm sure we must have some questions. I can see I can see who's attending, and there's usually some good questions coming. Les, do you want to kick off? Yeah, no. Uh, thanks for the update. I think um, one thing that I just picked up, and it was it was a, a full on um, summary. But you mentioned there was like a thirty million discretionary amount of money that you were still able to spend. Um, did I pick that right? And and um, mm -hmm. dis discretionary, do you have a sort of direction of travel about where you where you intend to put that, or um, <laughs> how, how does that get um, allocated? I guess is a, an interesting question. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, which I don't have the answer to now. Les, um, I we're still um, talking to government about what they mean by a discretionary fund. Uh, there is a great danger, as you can imagine, us choosing. Um, uh, one group against another group uh, without having any logic behind it. So we're asking for what the, um, the guidance will be in the distribution of that fund um, uh, right now. And I, I think we'll have an answer to that in a week or so, but I don't think we're going to we have the answer to you right now. We are, we are pushing for that to be where <clears throat> we believe there's um, most danger of businesses actually falling over. Uh, right at this moment in time and that we're giving them a chance to survive uh, is going to be just one of the general principles but where that is uh, is the most difficult question of course because yeah. almost, almost everyone can argue that they might be in that position can't they? okay uh, Catherine Leach yep do you want to come in hi Andrew um, I was just wondering about the rollout of the vaccination. Is there any indication how long you think it will take to vaccinate the city? Because obviously that's going to be a big step towards moving back to normal. And I accept it's obviously in the national uh, context as well. But do you know how long it will take to vaccinate Edinburgh? Well, I, I know how long it'll take. I, I know how long it'll take to get everybody over 50 in theory vaccinated, which will be me. Uh, so we should have everybody over 50 vaccinated by, and that's everybody, that's vulnerable or not, um, vaccinated to the extent to which they agree to be vaccinated, of course, because this is all voluntary, um, uh, done by me. And then my, I mean, my view is that I think we're probably at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of September before the whole city is vaccinated. I think maybe the more important question is how far 
um, does vaccination take us in terms of us being um, safely to return to activity? Uh, and that's that is a different question, which the scientists, even the scientists, don't know yet. Uh, I was on a phone call with Jason Leach and Gregor uh, Smith on Friday, where they were really saying that the biggest issue for them is they don't vaccinations right now will keep you safe if you're vaccinated. In other words, you won't be ill. You might have it, but you won't be ill. Um, it's more like a flu vac jab. But what it doesn't, what they're not sure about yet, is whether you can still give COVID to someone else. And that transmission, they're still not sure about, and they're waiting to see what happens with the first cohort. Um, but more and more vaccines being made available. Um, we, I think we've just got to hope that the plan of supply and the plan of um, delivery uh, is doable. We are certainly, as I've just suggested in conversations I'm on a phone call today at lunchtime, about community testing. So mass testing is the other um, so we can get a view, they can get a continual view about where we've got um, COVID arising. Um, and um, we will eventually get to a point where things like schools and um, uh, teachers, et cetera, are vaccinated, but not quite yet. Um, and we'll just need to wait and see. But May, I think, for everybody over 50, um, which includes me, which I, I guess that means I'll be uh, <coughs> in that cohort somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ella, I see you've put something in the chat. Do you want to ask your question? Um, it's pretty clear from, I mean, to raise people out of poverty and inequality um, will in itself have a big economic impact on the, you know, the city and the thriving of the city. Um, and Andrew has said his commitment is to the real living wage. A, and as a contractor, a significant contractor of services, outsourced services, I'm just wondering, will that be a standard that he would expect any outsourced services to also um, maintain? Well, if I'm being honest, Ellen has been really honest, that is just work in progress. What we don't want to do is put businesses out of business because we, have, we are enforcing living wage, but we're doing two things in our procurement, one of which is being more local, we already, we already um, procure something like 47% of all our buying, and that's quite a considerable bit of buying in the council, 500 odd million pounds um, is local. We, we intend to increase that percentage and the priority will be given to people who are um, implementing the real living wage. I think we understand though that that's just practically not possible to immediately do for everyone and I think we know that because we're trying to do it ourselves. So if I put everybody on a living wage, which we do, what I've got a problem is it straight away bumps up with those just above the living wage. And we yeah. stop having differentiations between right. one job and another. And we're having to readjust our whole wage structure to yeah. cope with the fact we're putting people on living wage. And that's why it's cost me 21 million pounds to do so. Um, and um, so I, we understand it's complex, and I think we just we're just yeah. trying to do it. So, yeah, the complexity is not lost on me, and the kind of ripple effect of it is not lost on me. Um, but I think in terms of um, early intervention, prevention, and lifting people out of poverty, it is a fantastic ambition for the city to have. Yeah, I think the whole thing about supporting apprenticeships through the guarantee jobs training etc and trying to give some incentive for businesses even in the circumstances we find ourselves to employ young people because we believe that actually the biggest effect in this in the in the next five years will be that young people are affected their employment is, is affected by um by the the this pandemic assuming that let's say it lasts for at least another six months we'll have had 18 months of disruption to education systems, to employment systems, et cetera, et cetera. And recovering from that is quite a big issue. Oh, Simon, see your hand up there, Simon Mill. Yeah, on, yes, thank you, Andrew, for the update. Uh, my question concerns green spaces. Obviously, we've learned through COVID the importance of quality green spaces. And I wondered if, uh, there is a, a sort of formal mechanism at the moment to uh, assess what we've learned during COVID relating to COVID, uh, green spaces, particularly in deprived areas, and have that as a as a work strand. Uh, looking at your very interesting work strands you gave, obviously green spaces 
falls into a lot of those areas, but yeah, wasn't actually highlighted. And I wondered if there's any work going to be going on in that area to improve uh, Edinburgh's access and quality of green spaces. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I do agree with you. It's important. I mean, I think Edinburgh thinks it's important as well. That's why we have 34 green flags parks in the city, which is more than anywhere else in the rest of Scotland. And probably, I, I think we're more than half the green flags parks in, for the whole of Scotland. So <clears throat> we do see as important. We we have determinedly not, um, for instance, cut our parks budget and our green spaces budget so we can maintain the spaces we have. What we are... Um, determining to do is when we look at neighbourhoods uh, is making sure we've got those 20 minute neighbourhoods have places where they can go to access green space. We can look after our informal as well as formal green space as part and parcel of the, um, the health of our population, but at local level. So you don't have to drive to it. You don't have to, um, yeah, you are able to walk to it and access that as easily as possible. And that'll be part of the 20 minute um, plan. And the other thing to say is, I think it's undoubtedly going to be the case that our, um, our um, city plan will um, absolutely uh, ensure that what we're not doing is building on green space uh, around the city, but using the brownfield um, facility we have to um, access buildings, difficult as that might be for a slightly restricted geographical city. Um, I think the determination of our members and everyone else is not to use the green space that we have surrounding us, which is precious to us as we, uh, as a city and and um, uh, to our population. So we'll make sure that doesn't happen. I, I might test one of my controversial statements actually on you, Andrew. I'm speaking at this panel uh, later on. Well, on you don't mind a controversial answer? On pl planning. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just kind of test it. You talked a lot about you know the twenty minute neighbourhoods, and that seems to be kind of the latest thing. Um, it it is a concept, not a model. So are we kind of in danger of um, knee jerking and using COVID as sort of um, an opportunity to make that ideological shift to what we would like the city to be, but at the expense of the social and cultural and economic heritage that we have in our city centres. I, I'm just concerned that our city centres feel like they're being a bit neglected. We still have to get people back into the offices. We've got significant reduction in footfall. And without our city centres being vibrant, how do we attract the talent, the entrepreneurs, the investment, and create that quality of life that make people want to come to our city? Okay, I, I'm not sure it's controversial. I think there's, of course, a danger of that, but the only place where we have actually have plans is for the city centre development and for our city mobility plan, which is mainly city centre based. So very clearly what we think we're doing with the city centre, this will be new plans for each of those neighbourhoods. As we go, there'll be a set of principles rather than a set of um, uh, uh, deliberate actions. And of course, we won't be able to do every single neighbourhood all at once, all together. I think if we apply those principles, you can start to see that um, creating sustainable communities that are local and allow local businesses to thrive. Uh, and on the understanding that quite a lot of our citizens actually work in the city centre, et cetera, and making sure that travel to those places and, and travel routes and, and those type of things are taken into account when we're doing so it is the way in which we intend to go about it. I think what you will see is um, a big acceleration of our plans for the city centre because we can. It is about not using COVID as an excuse, but using COVID uh, as an opportunity to renew what we're doing and, and, and delivering in that way. So, so I, I don't think there's a chance that we forget the city centre. The only working, um, the only working group we've actually got right now in this council that's working on any of this is, is actually a working group working on the city centre. So we, we're definitely not neglecting it. Good, thank you. Do we have any other questions? I think Fiona Doherty had a question. Hi, thanks. Um, morning, Andrew. Um, hi, Fiona. Thanks for, uh, hi, thanks for that. And nice to see you looking so healthy and fresh faced after that. Yeah. You're my goodness, you must yeah. be exhausted. <laughs> Well, that's one um, I, thing that's helped. I, I've been in my garage doing some training and walking uh, and keep myself fit. Good stuff. 
Um, so I think just maybe a little bit of the theme of what Liz just said, but I'm curious from a sort of future direction of travel for the council. You mentioned that you've got 18,000 staff now working from home. Do you see, uh, you know, to, in terms of supporting that city centre recovery and supporting the city recovery, that it's important to get at least part of them back working in offices again? And, and if not, then obviously that has something to do in, in terms of a knock-on impact, impact to, to office buildings, etc. So I, I suppose my question is, is the council thinking about getting people back into offices and what that then does to other big employers who are thinking about how that looks uh, in the future? Um, and then I guess just picking up on your point of reshaping the council, just a question is in terms of the business support elements to that, are there businesses involved in the consultation of how that might look? And I'm sure you welcome even more opinions than there currently are, but um, you know, how, how are the business community getting engaged in that reshape of the council to help? Yeah, so a good question. We've done two big surveys of our staff about their, their attitudes and how they feel about working from home, etc. already, because I think what's probably obvious to almost every single business is that, that the mixture of being at home and being at offices is never quite going to be what it was given the pandemic. I think we are in that space. I, and I'll use the for instance, I don't envisage ever again that we'll have 2,000 people sitting in Waverley Court uh, in any given day um, just with the council. I think there's opportunities to use our office accommodation, etc. better. There's always been pressure on office accommodation in the city centre um, and that there is an opportunity to do so as all businesses and developers actually think about what that work-life balance issue is going to be. Um, I mean, I, I've sat here, um, I think I've been, uh, and I maybe shouldn't admit it, but I've, I've only been into the city four or five times in, in this whole time, um, mainly to uh, visit my staff working out there in the, in the, on the front line, because I don't have 18,000, and I mean, there's something like six or 7,000 of our staff who are constantly out there working all the time for people, so social care, waste management, that type of thing. Um, and um, but the the attitude that's that what's coming back from our staff surveys is that most people would be content to um, come back to offices for part of the week. In fact, we'd wish to come back to offices for part of the week, but not for five days a week. Um, and I'm summarising horribly. There's a much more subtle <laughs> view than that, but it, but it, that's um, roughly what it, it looks like. So I envisage that we will, and if you just use me as an example, I think for me that would probably mean me in three days a week and and not and working from home two days a week because I can do this kind of thing. Um, and that's me as a chief exec, I guess. Um, and that'll depend on how um, understanding my members are about their, their need to be uh, looked after on a daily basis, which is part of what I do for my job. Um, so, um, but what we have been doing is we've already been speaking to um, people like Arcadis and, and the big de developers, big office owners, about what this might mean for the office accommodation and how we start to promote it, because that's what we're going to have to do. But I think there's opportunity in it. We, were had, we had lots of pressure on grade eight office space in the city which maybe we don't have quite so much now. If we were to share with NHS, for instance, or the police or some more of the public sector, then that creates space elsewhere in places, say, like Waverley Gate, as opposed to Waverley Court. And um, we, we're looking at all the options that we have as a public sector to do so, but also how we, um, how we uh, think about it in terms of our private sector partners and how they're going to use office accommodation and how we deal with the development of the city as it goes forward. It's not thanks, easy answer, I think. No, no, I know it's not. A, I know it's not an easy one. So, no, thanks. Just checking. I, I'm just checking, um, Ella. That was an interesting comment you made in the chat about the green spaces and about volunteers happy to uh, work to support these. It might be good for you and Simon to connect up on that because I know Simon's got a big sort of urban greening agenda. So, I, I think that could be a useful connection if you need us to connect you both up. Um, we can do that. Simon, yeah. Do you yeah, Ella, give us a call. Very happy to chat about that. It'd be worthwhile saying in that space, we've had lots of approaches from communities about 
um, doing some work in green spaces, just being, you know, community cleanups, community maintenance of green space, etc. And for some of our communities, that's undoubtedly a good thing. It's good for the health of the community. It's good for it's good for us because some somebody else is doing it, of course, um, and allows us to concentrate on other things. Um, yeah. Because I think there's no doubt what we're going to have to watch. We don't do is over promise and under deliver in the immediate future. We've got uh, financial constraints like everyone else, um, quite large financial constraints as a large organisation, but. Um, I, as I say, I am quite positive about us being able to lean into those agendas um, better than we were when we were coming into them, and that includes the Green Space Agenda. I, I think there's some good um, community initiatives already happening, th thinking of the Shoreline Initiative down at, at Leith. So yeah. it's build, building on what we've, what we've got rather than creating new ones. But I think the thing that we've learned is really listening more to the community rather than trying to decide what the community wants is actually getting the community to tell us what they want and how we're going to improve and make more biodiverse the green spaces. So I think I think there's some useful conversations to be had there. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. I first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Jane um, clark Hutchison, who is the President of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, thanks very much for uh, joining and, and doing the welcome this morning, Jane. I know she's extremely busy with her day job, but she's been a fantastic support to me in the Chamber through this um, to, and, the, and my board. So um, great thanks very much for joining us, Jane. Um, and I guess for me, listening to that, Andrew, I mean, we speak, you know, fairly regularly. And so I'm, I'm probably as, you know, more aware than, than many people of the work you're doing. But it is humbling, I think, to listen to the absolute range of challenges that you've faced and, and the range of services. You know, everybody likes to think that they are priority, you know, business feel that they are, you know, the engine drivers of the economy and therefore we need to, you know, have priority of support and services. But when you look at all the other uh, demands um, on the on the council services, uh, it's an incredible job that you're doing and um, how you're balancing it. Uh, as you say, you, you're obviously going to be upsetting um, someone um, when you prioritise someone above it. But I, I suppose I would put a pitch in for business that we are now going into probably one of the hardest times. We've been shut down for a long time. You know, that on off switch hasn't been great. And, and I think even speaking to the banks now, they say they are facing or seeing business failure at a rate that they had not anticipated and, and worse to come. And we are facing, you know, the end of some of the deferred payments where you know deferred VAT and NI and, and lo lots of these uh, payments are going to have to you know be called in. You know the loan repayments are due in, and I think just the level of debt that businesses now have, are, you know, going to have a big impact on how they respond to the recovery. Um, and I think what, what everybody is is looking at, you know, the latest budget I've heard is extending the cash flow runway, making sure that businesses have got cash to see them through this. And that that is the challenge because for, for you know, for the Edinburgh guarantee and, and for all the other things, we need businesses creating jobs uh, and creating employment. So I guess for me, it's it's a partnership, as you said, um, we have to work together. We, we have a particular perspective and we, we want to be heard and we, you know, we want to be able to express um, our contribution um, to policymakers to, to try to create that environment where we can all prosper. So I really appreciate you joining us today and talking so honestly about the challenges. And I hope that we will continue the dialogue. As you know, we've set up the Edinburgh Business Resilience Group and the purpose of that group is to capture the views of business around your five themes for your sustainable economic recovery plan um, and for us to be able to contribute and collaborate um, with both national and local government to help grow the economy. So you'll find that business, obviously the, the 70 odd people on the call are very keen to participate and contribute. So you, you know, you've got willing partners uh, in all of us here. So thanks very much for joining us. Thanks everyone else for joining us today. Um, if you've got anything you want to feed in, please, you, you know how to contact us. Um, your views are really important to us. Um, and I'm sure Andrew's very keen um, to hear and, and um, help him shape how we recover and grow the city. Thanks very much, everybody, and see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye.